The way this is going to work is she's going to talk to us for 20 minutes, and then there will be five minutes for Q&A after that. Just a note that we are starting at 3.30. Um, the programming across the board for the whole conference has been pushed back 30 minutes because of the wonderful talk we all just got to see. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rachel Marty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for hustling over from President Obama's talk. Um, I'm Rachel Marty. I'm currently completing my PhD in bioinformatics at the University of California, San Diego. I've also been working as a data scientist for NOAA Basketball for the past couple years. Because it's relevant to this topic, you may also be interested to know that I'm not just a data person. I may have been too small to play in the NBA or even the WNBA, but I did win a basketball state um, championship in high, in high school and was the captain of my college team at UCSD. To me, this is more than a research paper. It's an opportunity to give back to the sport that's given me so much. Traditionally, shooters have been evaluated on one number, shooting percentage. But in 2012, Kurt, Go Kurt Goldsberry revolutionized shot eva shooter evaluation by introducing a spatial component. He argued that we uh, evaluate players based on different positions on the court instead of just using one summary number. However, technology has come a long way in the last six years, and now we can use high-resolution shot capture in order to move from two dimensions to three dimensions. Instead of simply recognizing where shooters shoot poorly, we can start to understand why they shoot poorly from those places. 3D high-resolution shot capture has significant ramifications for the NBA. I'm going to talk about two of them today. First, it can provide actionable changes for shooter development. Second, it can provide unbiased player ranking for drafting and trading NBA players. First, allow me to introduce you to the NOAA shooting system. This is a system used to capture all of the data in today's presentation. Um, this is a picture of it from the Summer League. It's really small, so you probably can't see it, but it's a small black box, a sensor, that sits 13 feet above the hoop and captures all of the shots taken on that hoop. It captures who took the shot, where they took it from, whether the shot made or missed, and most importantly, how the shot made or missed. It captures this how with three shot attributes, left, right, depth, and entry angle. Let's watch a short uh, video to introduce us to these attributes. There are three attributes measured. The sensor can tell exactly where each shot was taken, so each measurement is taken where the front of the rim is the point closest to the shooter. The first attribute measured is left-right. The hoop is 18 inches, so if the center point of the ball crosses the center of the rim, it is zero. The left side of the rim is negative nine. The far right side is plus nine. The second attribute is depth in the hoop. The 18 inch hoop is measured with the front of the hoop as zero, and the back is 18. It's measured by where the center of the ball crosses the plane of the rim. The last attribute is entry angle. 90 degrees is straight down, and zero degrees is directly from the side. Most shots enter between 35 and 55 degrees. All right, so I used over 22 million shots captured in high resolution from NBA players, college players, high school players, in order to evaluate systematic biases from different positions on the court. Let's start with left-right. Here's a map of the court. It's broken up into six by six inch squares, and each square is colored by the average left-right value um, taken from that position on the court. Uh, white squares have no left-right bias. Red squares have um, a bias for players to shoot in the left side of the hoop from that position. And uh, blue squares have a, play have a bias for players to shoot in the right side of the hoop. In order to make sure we understand this map properly, we need to move from thinking in two dimensions to three dimensions. So let's look at a 3D shot chart. This is an actual shooter shooting an actual shot from our 22 million da shot database. Because it's in three dimensions, we can zoom behind the shooter and see the uh, perspective of the shooter. As you can see, the shot scored, but it went through a little bit on the right side of the hoop. We can see this even more clearly with the rim map. The green dot is exactly where the ball went through the plane of the hoop. You might notice there's no backboard on this map. That's actually on purpose. We want to make sure we can precisely tell what the depth of the ball was and the left right of the ball from any position on the court at one time. So, the rim map is always oriented toward the direction of the shooter. 
all right, let's get back to the left-right biases. Um, first, let's start by looking at a position um, that has no left-right bias and look and see how this looks in 3D. Remember, these are actual shots taken by actual players in our database. As you can see, the shots are evenly distributed on the left and right side of the rim map. This chart can help us better understand how these left-right values interact with shooting percentage. In this chart, the x-axis is the left-right value. The height of the bar represents the number of shots taken from this position with that left-right value, and the color represents the percentage of those shots that scored. As you can, as you could maybe see before, um, the shots were centered around zero, and the shots that went straight were more likely to score. Okay, so the first thing you may have noticed about this graph is the big red and blue blobs emanating at 45 degree angles from the hoop. These are bank shot zones, so where players are typically aim for a bank shot instead of a swish. So because we would expect there to be left-right biases in these zones, let's disregard them and look at the rest of the court. Um, the next thing that might jump out at you is that the entire left side is shaded blue and the entire right side is shaded gray, gr red, suggesting that just depending on which side of the court you're on, you're gonna have a left-right bias. These biases are most extreme in the corners. So let's look at the right corner um, in 3D to see how it looks. These are just some sh shots sampled from our database. And as you can see, the shots are um, prefer preferentially going in the left side of the hoop. We think this is probably because players are trying to avoid hitting the backboard. Um, this is the same chart as I showed you from the top of the key, but for the right corner. As you can see, Although the middle, um, the middle is denoted in um, black, the average uh, across the population is denoted in gray, two inches to the left of the black line. We see a similar trend in the left corner, but not quite as extreme. Um, the gray line is only um, an inch to the right of the black line. Importantly, when we look at all these graphs together, the left corner, the top of the key, and the right corner, we see that the region that scores, or the green area, is always centered around the middle of the hoop suggesting if there's a bias, we're gonna lose shooting percentage. In fact, we, looked, we estimated shooting percentage loss from the right corner, and for a player of typical NBA variation, they're losing about four percentage points if they're shooting um, to the left. Since the corner three is a very coveted shot in the NBA, you don't wanna be losing these percentage points. All right, next I'm gonna talk about depth biases in the hoop. But before I do that, I wanna reintroduce the, com uh, reintroduce the concept of the guaranteed make zone, or the GMZ. This is the area in the hoop where shots are guaranteed to score. You can see it in green. One thing I discovered in the paper I wrote last year is that the guaranteed make zone is not centered in the middle of the hoop at nine inches, but actually centered two inches deeper at 11 inches. With that insight, I colored the depth floor map the way I did, around 11 inches. So white squares represent positions on the court where players shoot 11 inches deep on the hoop in average. Um, red squares represent areas where they shoot um, shorter in the hoop, and blue squares represent places where they shoot deeper in the hoop. As you can see again, there's these blue regions in the bank shot regions. Um, so let's fo again focus on the areas where players tend to swish the ball, or try to swish the ball, um, and focus on the other areas. Uh, let's f first look at an area um, of good left-right depth um, in 3D. Um, notice that I've added a GMZ circle to the rim map. As you can see, the shots are evenly distributed around these, the 11 inch mark or the middle of the GMZ in this rim map. Now, if we look at a deep red area, we can see that um, more shots or red X's are accumulating in the front of the rim. This is suggesting that players are shooting short. Even the makes seem to be shorter in the rim. Again, we can, look, we can go back and look and see how this relates to shooting percentage. From um, 15 to 18 feet around the court, we see that the difference is relative, relatively small between the center of the GMZ, or 11 inches, and the average um, taken in the population at 10 inches. This is relatively inconsequential when it comes to shooting percentage. However, if we start taking steps backwards at 21 to 24 feet, or 27 to 30 feet, we start to see this gap widen. Um, for these deep threes, players are shooting three inches shorter than the optimal in the hoop. We estimate for an average NBA player, this, they're losing about three percentage points. That's significant as the deep three becomes more and more important in um, the NBA. The only way to correct for these would be to aim for 
um, the correct position in the hoop, and then you can regain um, those lost uh, percentage points. All right, so as you can imagine, each individual player is going to have their unique pattern in 3D. A reason that we could use um, these unique patterns in order to better estimate shooter ability. Shooting, estimating shooting ability is a difficult thing because shooting percentages vary, vary every day. Let's say we have three players, player A, B, and C. We bring them into the gym on Monday and have them each shoot 25 shots. Player A makes the most, player C makes the least, we might assume that player A is the best shooter. But if we bring them in again on Tuesday, player B may make the most, and player A might make the least. So who's the best shooter? You know, I'm gonna make this a little bit easier on you, because um, I'm gonna be talking about players A, B, and C for the rest of the presentation, so let's put a face to the name. Let's say player A is Commissioner Silver, and player B, maybe player B can be Daryl, and because he gave such a great talk, let's have player C be President Obama. So the question remains, who is the best shooter? Is it the commissioner, or Daryl, or the president? In the last slide, I just showed two 25-shot sessions. But if we have them each shoot hundreds of 25-shot sessions, we'll start to see probability density curves emerge. From this chart, it's obvious that President Obama is the best shooter, and that Daryl could use some work. If we increase from 25 shots to 100 shots, or to 500 shots, we see the probability density curves start to spread out suggesting that we can better estimate who's the best shooter. But it takes over 1,000 shots to really get them to have more confidence in that. So as I suggested, we, um, I reasoned that we could take this, uh, the 3D data and um, extract features from that in order to better predict the shooting ability. Um, so from a 25-shot session, as a first feature, I took the average of all the left-right values. As a second feature, I took the consistency or the spread of the left-right values. And then I did the same for depth, and the same for angle. Um, and then at the last three, I looked at the correlation between each of the three attributes. In order to assess the um, information stored in these nine features, um, I looked at 100 or, or hundreds of 25-shot sessions for each of these three players and calculated the nine features for each of them. Then I used unsupervised learning in order to cluster um, those sessions. This is the result. Um, let me explain this to you really quickly. So each dot in this graph is a 25-shot session colored by the player who took it. The proximity of two dots in this graph is representative of the proximity of two, two dots or two sessions across all nine features. So um, two dots here are, it, or the proximity of two sessions is representative of how much they look alike in three dimensions. As you can see, the sessions are clustering by shooter, suggesting there is a lot of information in this data. Because I saw a lot of information, we moved from an unsupervised approach to a supervised approach. As input, I used these nine features plus raw shooting percentage, the only, val the only value that's been used in the past. As output, I wanted to predict shooting ability, which I estimated as a player's cumulative shooting percentage for players who had more than 1,000 shots. We had 509 players that fit this description, more than 1,000 shots in a region from 18 to 22 feet. So I split them into a training test, testing set, and trained a gradient boosting regression on the training set and then tested the results on the testing set. As you can remember, from these probability density curves, it's pretty obvious that President Obama is the best shooter. We can visualize this in, an, um, in another way in this column. In this column, each uh, row represents a 25-shot session and colored by the shooter who shot the session, and they're ordered by shooting percentage. So higher shooting percentage at the top, lower shooting percentages at the bottom. Um, as you can see, most of President Obama's are at the top, and most of Daryl's are clustering at the bottom. But there's still a lot of mixing in there. So you see some of Daryl's red um, rows at the top and some of um, President Obama's blue rows at the bottom. Um, in an ideal situation, if shooting percentage could predict um, shooting ability perfectly, then we wouldn't see any of that mixing. However, we can take those same rows um, or same sessions and feed them into our model, and we start to see better separation. So we see more of President Obama's shots or sessions go to the top, and more of Daryl's go to the bottom. This is exciting because it suggests that for these three players, we can better rank players based on this model than we could with raw shooting percentage. 
I also used a couple quantitative metrics on the entire test set. Um, first, I looked at mean squared error and found that our model had about half the mean squared error of um, raw shooting percentage. Um, second, I looked at, uh, or I did a Spearman rank test and found that there was a higher correlation between our model and shooting ability than raw shooting percentage alone. These results are incredible because the first time ever we can evaluate a shooter with more confidence than we could with raw shooting percentage. The implications of this research are huge for the MBA. First, from the first part, if we remove these systematic biases, we can increase shooting percentages across the league. We can also use the same methods in order to um, find uh, individual biases in players and then correct those and optimize um, shooting percentages of individual players. Second, evaluating players and ranking them based on shooting ability is critical for NBA drafting and trading. As an NBA team, this would be extremely helpful when you have a, um, when you're bringing in a player for a short evaluation period, um, but you have to lay down a lot of money. If you have more confidence in their shooting ability, that's a great thing. All right. In 2016, I wrote a paper for last year's Sloan. Um, we had 22, or 20 million shots, and we gained incredible insight. Last year, I wrote this paper. Um, we had 22 million shots, and we revealed these systematic biases and could better rank players. Currently, NOAA's collected over 50 million shots in high resolution, and we predict that by next year's Sloan, we'll have over 150 million shots. Can you imagine what we can do with that data? Let me give you a couple ideas of what I'm thinking. First, we can create models like this for different shot, type, shot types, off the dribble, catch and shoot, from all different loca locations on the floor, and then optimize player um, combinations based on those results. Second, as we collect data for the same players over many years, we can start to track improvement and start to predict how players will improve over time. Imagine as a um, NBA team, if you're deciding whether or not to sign a player, if you don't only have confidence in their current shooting ability, but also have confidence in what their shooting ability will be in five years. That's huge. I think this time component will be the next big step for shooting evaluation. Who knows, maybe in a couple of years we'll have someone standing up here talking about the transition from 3D to 4D. Thank you for listening. We now have five minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll come find you with a mic. Rachel, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. On your ongoing research, are you talking about player combinations of shooting, or are you talking about a network of five players on the court and evaluating how those five players would result in a different shooting performance? I mean, there's lots of different things we could do if we have that information. Um, I come from a bioinformatics background, and so a lot of what we do is networks, and so evaluating how like those nodes on a network or players could interact, um, that would be a great idea. I think also just having the information of knowing which shooters shoot the best in which locations. Um, yeah, you can use those to, like there's a ton of insights that can come from that, for sure. So say you had like an NCAA season, so you had 500 shots from a player in game. How many shots in a like in-house session would you need with Noah to have more confidence in their shooting ability than that 500 shot sample from the season, especially given the fact that you probably want to predict in-game shooting percentages where there'd be more context from the game shots. Definitely. Um, things change when you're in a game, that's very true. It also can be difficult to compare to players who have been in different game situations. So if you have a player that has a fantastic point guard feeding them open catch and shoots, they're going to have a different shooting percentage than someone who has to work really hard for all of their shots, even if they have a similar shooting ability. So um, it, we can evaluate a little bit differently than you could in game, um, but maybe more accurately given the different situations players are put in in games. Uh, in the one map where you had um, the white squares represented where they hit the perfect 11 spot shot, 
Mm -hmm. uh, that area was mostly what would be considered like a long two, mm -hmm. which with the beginning of data in basketball is kind of what drew people away from the long two. The data yeah. was saying, don't take the shot, take the three instead. How can you, like, does that what you found mean that pretty much on average people always make that shot, the long two, or what exactly? I don't think they always make it. I think um, they just aim for the right depth. So I wouldn't recommend that everyone just start taking long twos. I think we should just train people to shoot for the right depth from the threes. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, I think it's a correctable error. I don't think it's just inherent. Great job, Rachel. Uh, really enjoy the presentation. I noticed on the slide with the uh, depth bias by shot distance, mm -hmm. as you uh, either increased or decreased the uh, from the guaranteed make zone, there seemed to be a non-symmetric uh, distribution as you um, in the shot probability of it being made. Um, if you were to uh, recalibrate the guaranteed make zone, assuming a larger uh, standard error or standard deviation on the shots in a game setting as opposed to uh, in practice, how would that change the guaranteed make zone and would the bias be as large as it appears in a practice setting where there's a lower variance? Can I make sure I understand that? So you're saying that you think the guaranteed make zone would be bigger in games? Uh, sorry, let me uh, clarify that a little bit. So the uh, shot probability on the, let's say for three-point shots, the shot probability mm -hmm. uh, as you move, as the uh, depth is less by five inches from the guaranteed make zone than five inches deeper, the shot probability is non-symmetric there. Mm. And if I understand correctly, the guaranteed make zone is uh, calibrated assuming some kind of standard deviation on a shot attempt. So it's calculated by the area or the depths and left, right, where um, you have, well, you're guaranteed to score. So there isn't really too much error there. So it, it doesn't take into consideration the, um, uh, like, dirty make. So if you're hitting the rim and still going in, and so um, maybe you'd have more of those go in for short shots than long shots. Maybe that's what you're getting at. Um, but from the simulations I've done um, with moving around the depth, um, we do see that closer to 11 is optimal. And if you start moving depths forward, then shooting percentages go down. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but maybe follow up with me after if that did Okay, matter. thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we can take one more question. Hi, thank you. Uh, did you notice any biases between left-handed shooters and right-handed shooters? So I actually didn't have data on which shooters are right-handed or left-handed, but I think there is a difference just because most of our players will be right-handed and we saw a much bigger bias from the right-hand um, corner than the left-hand corner. And so I think that does change your perception of how likely you are to hit the backboard and maybe even how likely you are to hit the backboard if you have bad left-right variation. Um, but it shouldn't really matter where you should be aiming for in the hoop. So I think if we collected that data, we would see it. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Okay, please, joining, please join me in thanking Rachel Marty. Thank you.